Welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 126. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Today, our featured guest is Jimmy Moore, a man who shed 180 pounds, shrunk his waist size by 20 inches, and dropped his shirt size from 5XL to XL in a year by following the Atkins diet. He is now following a ketogenic diet and is dedicated to helping as many people as possible find the information they need to make healthy lifestyle changes. Jimmy spreads his message through a number of podcasts, his blog, and YouTube videos, and he has a brand new book that just hit the market called The Complete Guide to Fasting, and fasting is a huge part of what we get into on the interview with Jimmy. So before we get into some of the details of what we discussed with Jimmy and talk about our sponsorships, we're going to get into an iTunes review. And this one is by Mamiza, a five-star review titled Inspiring, Clear, and Thought-Provoking. And Mamiza writes, I found this podcast a week and a half ago, and it's so addicting. I've been listening to an episode a day while walking to class and on breaks. I'm a college student majoring in public health and have always had a healthy framework, but this takes it to the next level. It gives me hope that I'll make something of myself since most of the guests have started their health journeys in their early 20s. I'm more conscious about what goes into my body and I've thrown out all my chemically ridden shampoos, lotions, and I'm slowly transitioning to get rid of my makeup. I feel like you guys are my friends and are holding me accountable to the holistic actions I've always wanted to take. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mamiza. These kind words mean so much to us. And we're so happy to see that you're making these great strides in your personal health journey. So congrats on that. So for the listeners out there who haven't taken the time to leave us an iTunes review, super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes. It only takes a minute. It gives us a boost in the iTunes charts. If you haven't done so already, please go and do so. And we thank you ahead of time. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior, and today I'm going to highlight a really fun concoction that I put together in my hotel room this morning. And what I like to do is I travel with Sun Warrior Protein, and I poured a little packet of it in a chia bowl. So I just bring some chia seeds with me, pour some Sun Warrior in, put in some superfoods, goji berries, mulberries, golden berries, dried fruit, of course. I don't have fresh with me on the go. And it's it's just so easy. And it's a great way to have a protein-packed, high-fiber, healthy-fat breakfast. And all you have to do is remember to bring your Sun Warrior with you. So I recommend if you get a big tub of Sun Warrior, just put some in some little baggies or travel-sized containers. That way you can travel with it and never be without it and make epic chia seed bowls in your own hotel room. And Marnie, I want to congratulate you. The reason you were in a hotel room this morning is because you were on Breakfast Television Montreal. That is huge. And a big congrats to you. How did that go? It went great. It was so much fun. I actually ended up making a super fruit smoothie. And that recipe you can find on my Instagram at Marnie Wasserman. And you can actually add Sun Warrior into that smoothie and load that up. And it's always fun sharing my passion, sharing my knowledge, and giving people some new ideas to make healthy eating simpler. So go ahead and make that chia seed bowl, guys. You're going to love it. So as listeners of the show, you guys get 10% off all your Sun Warrior products. Really easy to go and take advantage. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, put that order together in a bundle, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. So amazing products, great deal. Go and take advantage right now. And now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show sponsor, Raw Elements. And I have some exciting news for you guys today. They are having an epic discount on some good healthy fats, cacao butter and coconut oil from OGO Foods. So the cacao butter is 20% off and the coconut oil is 15% off. Two incredible healthy fats to add into the mix, which is perfect in lieu of today's theme all about eating more ketogenic. So these are awesome. They're great. And if you guys add these to your cart today, you're still going to get your 10% discount off your total order. So take advantage of this discount. You've got November and December to get 15% off the coconut oil and 20% off the cacao butter. And there's so many different recipes that you can make with this stuff. You can add them into elixirs, add them into smoothies, make your own chocolate even, and they are delicious. So have fun with them and stock up today. And as Marnie already mentioned, as a listener of the show, you get 10% off all your Raw Elements products. 
Really easy to take advantage. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. And for listeners in the US and Canada, bundle that order together, spend $100 or more and get free shipping. So really great deals. Go and take advantage, guys. And you can thank us later. Okay, now back to Jimmy and some of the things we cover on today's show. We talk about the health benefits of fasting and get into some of the fasting myths. We talk about how to make fasting a relatively pleasant experience. And we also get into the ketogenic diet and the benefits of being in ketosis. We also talk about exogenous ketones and MCT oil. We also get into Jimmy's current diet and what he eats in a day. And we talk about the importance of managing stress. Really, really important. So much good stuff that we get into with Jimmy and we're excited for you guys to listen. So here we go with Jimmy Moore. Hi, Jimmy, and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. How are you today? Hey, hey, what's going on? Jimmy, it's great to have you on the show, and uh, this is an exciting time for you. You have a new book out, The Complete Guide to Fasting. Congrats on that, and uh, how has that whole process been? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Yeah, it's been an amazing process. Um, I've done several books with this publisher that I'm with now called Victory Belt, and this is my fourth release with them. And it's interesting because each one I've learned something new about kind of writing a book and <laughs> getting it out there into the public. And this one has just broken all the rules uh, because so many people are interested in the subject matter that I think they broke Amazon the first day. Uh, they actually sold out of every single copy they brought in, which is pretty unprecedented. Wow, that's huge. Congrats. And uh, we're definitely fascinated by the subject. And this is something we we haven't really dug into on the show. So we're excited to bring this information to our audience. So let's jump right in. You could say that you're fascinated. (laughs) That's a bad pun. (laughs) I like it. I like it. So Jimmy, (laughs) let's just start off talking really broad here. And let's talk about what fasting is and what are the different types of fasts. Oh my gosh, there are so many different people using the F word out there as I refer to it in the book. Uh, I call it the F word because at one point it was the F word to me, like the F word, uh, but now I realize the powerful healing properties that that fasting brings. But yeah, I mean, you'll hear people out there say, oh yeah, I'm fasting, and they're referring to like a juice fast, or I'm fasting and they're talking about within like the low carb circles that I uh, am in about like a fat fast where you're eating like a lot of fat to try to kickstart ketosis and, and things like that. What we're referring to in this book is truly fasting. So fasting in its purest sense is not eating any food at all, just drinking water. And that is the, the purest form of a fast that you can possibly do. I suppose there is this thing called dry fasting that we don't address because My co-author, Dr. Jason Fung, does not use it, but it's where you don't even drink water. So it's no food, no water. So that's kind of intense to me. But um, what we're referring to here is no food. So he realizes, Dr. Fung realizes he's put well over a 1,000 patients on various kinds of fasts. He realizes not everyone will be compliant with a no food at all, no calorie at all fast. So he allows a little bit of wiggle room that if you need some something like bone broth or maybe kombucha, maybe some black coffee with a splash of heavy cream, those things are totally acceptable as well. So uh, the bottom line is to try to keep the caloric load as low as possible so that you can get the benefits that fasting will give you. And what are those benefits? Let's get into some of those. Oh my gosh, there are so many benefits. And what's interesting about this is a lot of them are the exact same benefits of another passion of mine, and that's ketogenic diets. And so when you keep the insulin load low on a ketogenic diet, you get a lot of these benefits. Well, guess what? When you don't eat food, you're getting a lot of those same benefits, I would just say probably to an nth degree more than a ketogenic diet. So lower inflammation is a huge one. This is one that I think isn't emphasized enough because we don't really talk about inflammation. We talk about, well, I have high cholesterol or I have, uh, which by the way, that goes down as well. You know, I have, uh, you know, other kinds of things that we think are diseases when they're not really diseases. So the things that do get better, your brain health. I'm currently in day six of a 21 day fast. Do I sound like I have low energy right now? No, I'm pretty high energy right now. (laughs) And my brain health is just spectacular. I have great concentration, 
clear mind. It's just, it's truly amazing. Your mood can stabilize. I mean, I could go on and on. And actually one of the graphics in our book, the complete guide to fasting, we put in there that even atherosclerosis itself, which is uh, heart disease actually can reverse with fasting. So this is a powerful modality and certainly the length of the fast can vary from person to person depending on your need for going longer or shorter. And we can definitely talk about those things here in a minute. Okay. Well, one area I want to dig into before we go any further is intermittent fasting. And this seems to be getting a ton of attention today in the health world where just in a really broad sense, just to give the listeners an idea, this is when you're not eating first thing upon awakening and you're having your last meal relatively early and and giving yourself that period of time where your body is in a fast. So you're you're only basically eating, say, between 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. or something like that. So, Jimmy, can you take that and roll with it and get into intermittent fasting? Sure. So intermittent fasting is where, like you just described beautifully, you're trying to eat within a very small window. So a lot of popular intermittent fasts say, well, eat within an eight-hour window, so 12 p.m. to 8 p.m., for example, and then don't eat from 8 p.m. until 12 p.m. the next day. That's that's an intermittent fast in uh, a lot of the things that I've seen out there. I've even seen others say eat within a four or five hour window. And I know some people that try to eat within a one hour window a day and they fast for 23 hours of that day. So intermittent fasting can be anything between those things. But the whole point is you're giving your pancreas a rest. You know, we live in such a culture these days, you guys, that breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, midnight snack. We're constantly eating because the food is literally everywhere. I mean, I I live one mile away from about just about any cuisine I want to get. And most of it's what I like to refer to as crappy garbage (laughs) hanging around out there. So I, I just avoid those things and you don't need to eat as much as you think you do. And so that's where that's where intermittent fasting comes into play. But here's, here's a little secret that makes intermittent fasting so simple. When you cut down on the refined carbohydrates, when you cut down on the foods that turn to sugar in the body, which can be most carbohydrates, starches do that, obviously grains and sugars, of course, and then replace those with fats, then you're not able to see – quite the increases in your insulin levels, and you get healthier. I mean, that that's kind of the bottom line of what an, an insulin-resistant person has to do to eat healthy. And so when you do that, when you eat that way, something amazing happens. You spontaneously intermittent fast. I can go, sometimes I can go where I eat maybe at one or two o'clock in the afternoon, as, as you mentioned, and then I won't eat till maybe one o'clock two o'clock the next day. So it's so easy to do that. Intermittent fasting is certainly a great modality. If someone's not already established that uh, as their fasting, I would say shoot for kind of that 12 to 18 hours between meals. And get this, you guys, when you go to bed at night, let's say you had your meal at six o'clock at night, your supper, and then you eat you know, your breakfast at say 8 a.m. the next day, guess what? You intermittent fasted. (laughs) You slept through most of it, but you did intermittent fast. And all we're saying is add a few more hours to that and you'll see tremendous benefits in your health. And the conversation has really changed over the years from eating every couple of hours, which is something most people are obsessed with, thinking that's how they need to feel their body, that's how they're going to lose weight. And this is what's so fascinating about the conversation of fasting. But I want to kind of go back and talk about our evolution. This is something that our bodies have been adapted. Can you expand on this? Oh, my goodness. I mean, think about hunter-gatherer man. Did he just go to his refrigerator and pull out the leftover pizza from the night before and the meatloaf and the... no? They didn't have leftovers. What they did was they had to go out and they had to kill and gather. So they kill the animal and they gathered, uh, you know, the few little bits of vegetation that were around. Uh, But most of it, most of their sustenance was from the kills. So guess what? They had to go days upon days, maybe upon weeks without eating. So how did they sustain themselves When they're not eating at all, you know, all these people uh, out there have these negative images about fasting. Well, you'll just, you know, lose all your energy and you won't be able to get anything done. Well, if that was true, we probably would have died off 
as a people group a long time ago. Humans would not have survived if we couldn't withstand long periods of fasting. And so from an evolutionary standpoint, you're saying it brilliantly, we had to be able to go hunt and in a fasted state. And so that's where the body is not stupid. God didn't make us uh, to not be able to withstand that. And so we can go out and we have energy because your body very fluidly shifts from being a sugar burner to being a fat and ketone burner. And that's what sustains you during a fast. Okay, Jimmy, before we move on from here, I think a fun thing to do is let's go back and talk about your first experience with fasting. And this was an alternate day fast. You talk about it in the book. And so you're basically, well, not basically, what you're doing is one day on food, one day off. And I'll just have you share the story of how that went. Yeah. I mean, when I first heard about this whole concept of even intermittent fasting, this was 10 years ago, I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. Why would you purposely starve yourself? Why would you keep food out of your body when you're hungry. Aren't you going to get hungry? You know, I was one of those people that kind of believed all the lies about fasting that people say because it's it's naivete. You just don't know what you don't know. And so, so yeah, when I finally got up the gumption to try it, it was miserable to me because, number one, I didn't have the right mindset because I went into it thinking this is going to suck. And guess what, guys? It sucked because I went into it with that mindset and that was that was my first exposure to fasting. And I was doing kind of an intermittent fast of about, like you said, about every other day I was eating. And that was not fun at all because, again, I was not doing it the right way. I was still trying to take vitamins during it. I was still doing all kinds of things wrong that we now share what I did wrong and, and how to do it right in the new book. But you know what? I see that as nothing but the first step towards the success that I am today at fasting, because had I not tried and failed, which was predictable, and anyone listening right now, if you're going to try a fast, know that the first time that you probably try a fast, you're going to fail and you're going to fall miserably on your face. And that's okay. I think that's something that we need to get used to, that the road to success is paved with a lot of heartache and pain and, and quote unquote failures. It's not a failure unless you just totally give up altogether. So I'm glad I did not give up from that very first attempt and that I'm able to now, you know, fast very easily for days and weeks. And Jimmy, what were a couple of the things you learned from that first fasting experience that you bring forward to the fasting you're doing today? Oh my gosh. I think a a lot of the lessons that I learned were just little mistakes that I made. So at at the time I was still drinking diet soda. Uh, I used to drink 16 cans of Coca-Cola a day back in my morbidly obese days. I lost 180 pounds on the Atkins diet in 2004. And so I came from a a very bad place at one point and shifted those sodas to diet sodas. And at the time when I was trying this, I was still drinking diet sodas. I don't drink them nearly as much anymore. Uh, But at the time, that was a huge mistake because the artificial sweeteners can actually stoke cravings and hunger. And when you're trying to fast, that is not a recipe for success. (laughs) So don't do that. And then some of the other things that I did, uh, I kept up the exercise intensity, which please exercise during a fast. That's totally cool. We definitely write about that in our book. But I think if you're trying to do glycolytically demanding exercise, you should probably put that down at least during the fast and know that the fast is just for a temporary amount of time. So you're not doing it for months on end, you know, years on end. You're doing it for maybe a few days, maybe a week for most people. Uh, and for the very insulin resistant people a little longer than that. So just set aside that time not to do your glycolytically demanding exercise and you'll be a lot better off in the end. So you've described why fasting is beneficial. We've got some benefits out of that. We understand that our body has the ability to do this. But let's say the listener who's listening right now thinking, why would I do this? Or what's the main reason I can go ahead and do this? Or me and my friends can get started on this. What do you have to say just to give people that inspiration to want to give this a go? Yeah, I, th- that is a superb question. That That's the question. Because if you don't have a why, then you'll never do anything. And so the why is this. 
if you deal with any kind of adiposity on your body, so you have extra weight on your body, if you're dealing with type 2 diabetes, and even before it gets to type 2 diabetes, there's prediabetes and then this condition known as insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, if you haven't heard about it, you guys, is one of those things that leads to most chronic diseases that we're having today. Most people walking around with a little extra weight on their body and even some that don't have extra weight are dealing with insulin resistance. And so to heal the insulin resistance, fasting and a ketogenic diet have been shown to be the two best modalities for doing that. So go ketogenic first. And I wrote a book about that called Keto Clarity if you're interested in learning more about it. But then if ketogenic is not good enough for healing the insulin resistance, that's when fasting comes into play. So that's what kind of got it on my radar screen, you guys. I'd been ketogenic for a little while uh, after being low carb for a while, and I'm still dealing with a lot of the effects of the insulin resistance, and fasting has helped to heal that. Now, it's not going to heal it overnight. I mean, I, I didn't get to be as insulin resistant as I am overnight, so it's going to take time to heal that just as it took time to mess it up and to, to create that. So I would say that would be the biggest compelling reason. And if people aren't already like measuring their blood sugar and measuring, measuring their insulin levels at their doctor, you can measure blood sugar at home and you need to be doing that. You need to be doing that as soon as possible because that's going to tell you whether or not you're insulin resistant and whether this would be a great modality for you or not. Okay. And Jimmy, in the new book, you share a bunch of different fasting myths. And what I'd like to do now is grab a few of these and, and dig in and bust these myths. So sure. let's jump into the first one here. Fasting makes you burn muscle. Let's talk about that. You know, I actually tested this on myself because that is a common myth that people believe out there. So in January of this year, I actually went on, uh, the hopes was to do it for all 31 days of January to fast. And, and what I did was I got a DEXA scan before and a DEXA scan after to see what the results would be. So uh, a DEXA scan for people that don't know what that is, it measures bone density, uh, lean tissue, and fat mass. Um, and so obviously for the purposes of a fast, uh, you're not going to lose bone, but you could lose muscle and could lose body fat. So I wanted to test that. So I only made it 28 out of those 31 days. I say only, that's actually kind of cool to do. So, <laughs> so I um, I made it 28 out of 31 days and I tested, like I said, before and after with, with that. And when I got done with the experiment and I did the DEXA scan, it actually showed that I lost 10 pounds of body fat and it showed that I lost 10 pounds of what it showed as lean tissue. So people are like, oh my gosh, you lost so much muscle during that fast. But what was interesting was it breaks down where the quote unquote muscle was lost. And in my arms, you guys, I actually gained muscle. In my legs, I gained muscle. Now, keep in mind, I didn't really exercise during this fast. All I did was fast because I didn't want the exercise to be a confounding variable. And the only place that it showed that I lost muscle was what's called the trunk area. So think about your neck to about your waist. So encompassed in there are your, are your organs. So when I talked to my co-author, Dr. Fung, about this, he said, oh, well, it seems like what happened was you lost fat around the organs, which the DEXA scan mis mistaked as muscle. So it's a good thing when you fast. You're not losing muscle, and definitely Dr. Fung provides lots of resources and uh, references in that chapter where he's talking about the myths to talk about that. But, you know, it's one of those things that's going to persist, and it's hard for people to wrap their minds around how you don't lose muscle when you're fasting, but it's just not true. And what was the idea behind gaining muscle in your arms and legs? Did you guys figure out what was going on there? Now, it was minimal. It was maybe like a half a pound in each. I think it was a pound in the legs, a half a pound in the arms. So uh, statistically, really not that different. But the point is, if I lost muscle in the trunk, why wouldn't I have lost muscle also in the arms and the legs? Right, for sure. Okay, and Jimmy, next myth we're going to bust here is that fasting deprives our body of nutrients. Let's have you uh, go on that one. Well, you know, it's interesting. The Nobel Prize winner for medicine this year, I don't know if you guys heard this or not, 
was this guy that won it for his work looking into the effects of, of fasting on autophagy and kind of the whole cellular regeneration and, and cleaning the cells. And so uh, one more time, what was the question? Nutrient density? Are you yeah, lacking nutrients? That doing a fast is going to deprive your body of nutrients. And I mean, you're not taking in any calories, any food, so you can understand why people would think that. But you know what's interesting? When people think you're not taking in calories, any food, if you have any body fat on you at all, yes, you are. You're eating your body fat. And so this is a concept that isn't talked about enough in nutritional health circles is when you're not eating, guess what? You're eating. You're eating what is in your body. Now, obviously, if you're a lean person and you have very little body fat, obviously someone like that probably needs to be eating food and especially fat to keep that fat burning going. But most people walking around have at least a little bit of body fat on them that will sustain them. Now, as far as nutrients go, you're only going a, a minimal amount of time without food, most people when they're fasting. So if we're talking about an intermittent fast, I mean, what is it, 18 to so hours during the day that you're not eating, you're not going to lose too much nu nutrients <laughs> during that time. You're actually making your body, you're, you're basically cleaning out your body during a fast. And, and that's kind of a nice way to think about it that, you know, from time to time you need to clean, clean the body. And that's what a fast helps to do. And in the cleaning of that body, you're kind of, uh, you know, resetting the cells and allowing the, the body to be new again. And the nutrients, uh, when you start eating again, just make sure you eat a high quality diet when you do eat. So let's talk about that. And this brings in a third myth of fasting can result in overeating. So does that happen? Do we become so hungry that we just want to eat everything? And what would be a great meal to have in between a fast? You're doing 21 days. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so yes. what's your first meal going to look like? I'm, I'm shooting for 21. I'm, I'm certainly shooting for 21. Let, let's hope I get there. Uh, day six. So um, I, I'm sorry, one more time on the original question. Yeah. Does it result in overeating? Would it cause someone to eat more? Overeating. Yeah, that's right. So I actually have personal experience with this as well. Having done longer fast last uh, September, I did a 17 and a half day fast where I didn't eat for 17 and a half days in a row. And I thought, okay, when this is over, I'm going to be so ravenous. I'm just going to eat everything in sight. But guess what, guys? That doesn't happen. And one of the things that you need to know when you break a fast, you don't want to eat a lot because actually that could hurt you, <laughs> physically hurt you. My co-author, Dr. Fung, actually uh, did do that. He he went on a pretty long fast, maybe seven or eight, nine days. And then he tried to eat a big meal and he was feeling stomach pain for hours. <laughs> so don't do that. So what we recommend is you eat a little something, maybe 30 minutes before your main meal when you break the fast. So eat like a small salad, maybe have a few nuts, maybe like string cheese, just something to kind of get the blood flowing to the stomach again. And then 30 minutes later, eat your normal meal. But here's what I found when I started eating normally again and eating the meal again. I couldn't eat it. I couldn't eat all that I would normally eat. You actually end up eating slightly less and sometimes significantly less than what you're used to. So of course, some people say, well, your stomach must have shrank. Well, no, your stomach doesn't shrink, but your, your mind is so in tune with not eating that now you're starting to put food in the body. It's a bit like trying, trying to ride a bicycle again after not riding it for a while. Um, and it's a cool sensation that does come back within a couple of days, two, three days, you are eating normal again, but, uh, yeah, you've got to be, um, you won't overeat. I, I, I think that's a misnomer that needs to be, um, squelched because I don't think you could possibly, you know, just gorge yourself unless you did something wrong in your fast. Now I can tell you there was this thing that I did wrong in a fast back in 2011 when I did a one week fast and it was the end of the week. The seventh day was on a Sunday. I went to church and they served communion that day. And I had the little wafer and I had the little cup of juice. And I get home and I'm having full on hypoglycemia from that little bit of carbohydrate that I had put in my body after seven days of not eating. And so, so that day I was ravenous, but that was a mistake that I made that I know now not to do something like that to avoid that. So what should that first meal look like when you're coming off of a fast? 
Oh, yes. Thank you. So it depends on what your diet is, but I obviously am a huge proponent of a ketogenic diet. And in the back of the complete guide to fasting, we actually include quite a few recipes. It was so funny. My, my publisher, when I was telling them about the book, they're, they're mostly a cookbook publisher. And they're like, so we'll need 50 recipes for this fasting book. And I went, um, cold water, lukewarm water, hot water. What do you mean? Recipes. What do you mean? <laughs> so, uh, the recipes are indeed, um, ketogenic. So I would just say, you know, get some meat and veggies and that probably will suffice for you. So like a small steak and some vegetables, put some butter on top and don't overdo it. Don't think that you're going to be just so ravenously hungry that you make this, you know, big plate of food. Cause you're going to have a lot of leftovers at the end of it. But I think just being sensible and not overdoing it on that first meal is always going to be the best way to go. Okay, makes sense. And what happens to our metabolism during a long fast? And assuming that it goes down, does that bounce back after the fast is over? Yeah, it obviously goes down and it's definitely um, reflected in the fact that you can't eat as much um, and some people have even uh, launched the criticism, well, you're you're lowering your set point of calories, so fasting can be dangerous. Those things are just not true. I mean, what you find is the metabolism gets better because you've improved your insulin sensitivity. When you're not eating food, insulin sensitivity has nowhere to go but up and improved. And if you're insulin resistant, it could take a lot longer, like I said earlier, but the, the insulin sensitivity is so important, you guys, and I hope people get this message that anything you can do to improve that is going to be a bonus for you in your, in your metabolism. So not eating uh, food at all will do that the best. So yeah, just give it a try. I mean, the worst case scenario is you give it a try for a few days, you see how you respond and if you didn't like it, then you know it's not a modality necessarily for you. And fasting is not for everyone, by the way. And we mention in the book who should and who should not be fasting. And it's a very clear list of people. So, But the vast majority of you listening, yes, you can. Okay, Jimmy, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Some of the sure. obvious people that should be fasting or shouldn't be fasting. And yes. talk about if somebody's going to take this on one of our listeners and this is totally new to them, but they're like, yes, this is for me right now. I'm going to get into this. Who would need some medical supervision if they're going to do this? And Great. what length of fast starts to require that medical supervision? Ooh, you're asking a lot of questions at one time. So let's back up to the first ones that you asked. Who should not fast? So these are the people that should not fast. If you're pregnant, you should not fast because you got to take care of that little baby that's growing inside of you and that baby needs uh, nutrition. So don't fast if you're pregnant. That should be a well duh, but I thought I'd say it anyway. And then the other group that's obvious who should not fast are those people who are underweight. So that's not a problem for most of the population. We are a very overweight and obese society, but there are underweight people out there. And if you have an underweight issue, there's certainly something going on with you. Uh, medically that fasting is probably not a good idea because when you fast, guess what? You're going to lose weight. So you don't need to lose weight. So those are the two categories primarily that I think need to avoid fasting. The people who absolutely need to fast are people who are morbidly obese and people with especially type two diabetes, prediabetes and insulin resistance, that whole category of people that I talked about earlier. So those are the people that need to do this more than anybody. Now, what was the last component? Yeah, medical supervision. People that, yes. what segment of the population should have medical supervision if they're going to do this? And for yes. what length of fast? Great. So I think type 1 diabetes is one of those conditions that you probably should do this under the care of a medical supervisor. And unfortunately, most medical doctors are prob probably going to freak out about Fasting, unfortunately, Dr. Fung is one of the only people uh, using uh, fasting protocol with patients in the entire world. So he's there in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, so try to find one that will work with you and usually functional medicine practitioners uh, and some of these alternative uh, healthcare naturopaths and things like that can actually be more willing to work with you. But if you're a type one, you got to adjust that insulin. And so you you can try to do it on your own, but when you're fasting, 
there are so many like variables that can impact your insulin needs because you still will need some insulin because without the insulin, the type one would die. So type ones are, are a big one, but I would say anyone that has any kind of medical condition. So, you know, if you've had a stent put in your heart and you have heart disease, you probably should be under a doctor's care. That doesn't mean that fasting is going to harm you, but it means that the doctor should probably watch medications and watch all of these things. And if you're taking any medications for any kind of condition, that's another person that probably needs to be under medical care. You don't want to go on any kind of diet change or not eating without the care of a doctor if you're already taking medications because the medications are basically – most of the time covering up what's happening in your diet. So don't willy-nilly just keep taking your medications and go on a fast because you will have side effects from that. So for those who are going to take on a fast, what are some tips you can give them to make the fasting experience pleasant and enjoyable? Pleasant and enjoyable. <laughs> That's cute. Relatively. Uh, because it's not – I was going to say I was gonna say relatively pleasant and enjoyable. I, I think the biggest thing people can do – is to take the first step. I, I think if you don't start, you'll never experience it. And like I said earlier, you've got to start and fail and start and fail and start and fail. And then about the third or fourth time you start doing this, you're going, okay, now this is getting easier. You know, I failed so many times doing intermittent fasting and then got it down. And then when I got intermittent fasting down, then I got alternate day fasting down. Then when I got alternate day fasting down, then I could fast for you know a few days. Then when I got that down, I could go seven days. And now I'm pushing 21 days. So it, it's just like learning any new skill. You just got to kind of get good at it. And you're not, you know, those guys in the NFL, they're not good from the start. They started in a little peewee football and they got better over the years. So be kind to yourself, be patient with yourself and it will get easier. And use things um, that will help make the fast even better. So one of the things that we talk about in the Complete Guide to Fasting is, okay, the perfection would be just water, but if you start to feel a little shaky or if you start to have issues, maybe have a little bone broth with sea salt. Maybe have a little kombucha. Maybe have some black coffee if you like coffee with a splash of heavy cream. Just a little something that will help you get through it because getting through it and getting the benefits from it is so much better than stopping long before you would get those benefits when you were just so close to having that breakthrough. Okay, Jimmy. And we're going to switch gears now. And you have a profound weight loss story. And I want to take things right back to the beginning of that and take our listeners through the story of your your journey of losing the weight and, and getting yourself healthier. And where that starts, a perfect jumping in area is back in 1999 when you went on an ultra low fat diet. Mm. So what weight were you at at this time? And what happened when you, you switched your diet around? Yeah, so in 1999, uh, it was actually the year that something uh, pretty shocking happened in our family. It was when my uh, brother, four years older than me, his name's Kevin, uh, he had a series of heart attacks within the span of one week that nearly killed him. He was 32 years old. And so that shook us all. And I remember at the time going, well, whoa, I'm 28 at the time, and I was like, that's me in four years if I don't get my act together. So I go on what everyone in the world would go on, that what we've all been led to believe is a healthy diet. I cut out all the fat in my diet in 1999. And so I went on a, a basically a no-fat diet. I, I ate things like naturally fat-free marshmallows. And it, it says it right there on the package, a, a low-fat food Twizzlers. And, and diet soda and all these things that I thought were prudent to eat. And so I lost a significant amount of weight. I'm, you asked what the starting weight. I think I was around 370 when I started that one, 370 pounds. And I lost a significant amount, over 150 pounds on that. And I lost the weight. And I remember coming home one day and my wife, Christine, said, hey, will you go to McDonald's and get me a, a meal? And I say, okay, I'll get you a meal if you'll let me have one just this one time. So you guys know what that's code for. It means I'm about to binge. And I did binge, and I binged, and I binged. And the next uh, three, four months, I gained all that weight back and then some. And so then flash forward to 2004, 
that was the big year that I made my significant uh, diet change that has me passionate about what I do now. And it was in 2003 at Christmas time. I got a diet book for Christmas. Anybody ever gotten a diet book for Christmas? <laughs> I did every year from my mother-in-law. So Christine's mom would give me diet books every year. One year I got uh, Dr. Phil's book, Today Can Be a Changing Day in Your Life. And I'm like, no, Dr. Phil, that's another low-fat diet. It's not going to help me. <laughs> So she gave me a book that year that just totally rocked my world and literally changed my life forever. And it was Dr. Atkins' New Diet Revolution. I read that book from cover to cover between Christmas and New Year's. And I said, this guy is out of his mind. How do you cut your carbs and have any energy at all? How do you eat more fat? Isn't this guy a cardiologist? Doesn't he know that's going to clog your arteries, give you heart disease? And yet I had tried so many low-fat diets and failed just like I had in 1999 that I was like, what the heck? I have never tried anything like this before. It sounds wild, but let's give it a go. So in January of 20, uh, 2004, I went on the Atkins diet as prescribed and in the first month lost 30 pounds pretty quickly. I was up to 410 uh, when I started. So I lost 30 pounds. And so I was a very svelte 380 pounds after that. And the second month I was so energetic, I had to go uh, walk on treadmills. So I started walking on the treadmill within month two, lost another 40 pounds in the second month. By the end of 100 days, I had lost 100 pounds. And by the end of that year, I had lost a total of 180 pounds, which basically put my name on the map of the diet world at that point. The Atkins people heard about it. They posted my uh, my story on the front of their blog and and everything. And then I started getting all these emails from around the world. Hey, where are you? Where's your book? Where? I'm like, well, you people leave me alone. So I, I started a blog in 2005 called Live in La Vida Low Carb. And one year later, this guy said, if you talk half as good as you write, you should be a podcaster. And of course, you guys know podcasts 2006. There weren't any health podcasts out there in 2006. And so, uh, so he said, yeah, let's start one. So, uh, we did a compilation one for a little while where it's a bunch of contributors. And finally he's like, dude, people love you. They want to hear just you. So we started the live in La Vida low carb show about 10 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but now it's the longest running health podcast on the internet today. Wow. What a powerful story, Jimmy. And and thanks for sharing that. And congrats on losing all the weight and getting your health back. I'm just curious, since going on the Atkins diet and, and losing all that weight, how has your diet evolved since to where you are today? Oh my goodness. And, and this is a lesson, you guys, regardless of what plan you're on now, if you stay static in whatever plan you chose, you're missing it. You've got to continue to realize that, you know, I'm not, I was uh, 32 when I started the Atkins diet. I'm now almost 45 years old. Your body is different when you get older. So you've got to tweak things around a little bit. So I've added all sorts of uh, modalities to it over the years. It started off with the Atkins diet. When the paleo diet came around, I started adding in the real food aspect and trying to focus a lot more on the real foods. And then when I started getting real interested in the, the geekiness of testing for ketones and blood sugar in 2012, I started doing that. So you tweak it a little more. And then in 2015, started really getting serious about doing the fasting. So you need to be your own best health advocate because the doctor's not going to do it for you. Your dietitian's not going to do it for you. Your mommy's not going to do it for you. You have to gain back control of your own health. You have to be the final arbiter in your health and make those changes. And the only way you can do that is if you constantly educate yourself. So kudos listening to the Ultimate Health Podcast because you know here, here you're going to get really good information that you can apply to your life. And just keep trying things. I think that's the other thing. People are just afraid to try anything. So then they do nothing and nothing changes in their health. So that's how I've evolved is I've constantly been a student of Jimmy Moore and my body and realizing that I've got to change things up a little bit from time to time. And when something works, guess what, guys? Hello. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep doing whatever it is that's working. But if something's not working, then you need to change things up. And let me say one more thing on the working aspect. A lot of times people say, well, a diet worked or it didn't work based on solely on weight loss. Can I tell you, don't do that. 
please look at health gain more than weight loss. Health gain is so much more interesting. So health gain is measured in your blood markers. When you're testing your blood, you go get your blood work done at your doctor. And if you have a, happen to have maybe a little extra weight on your body, but you've got incredible health markers, dude, you need to celebrate that and not bemoan that your diet didn't work because the weight didn't come off. Such an important message that needs to come up again and again. So I'm so happy you addressed that. You know, Jesse and I are huge advocates of the Marnie diet and the Jesse diet, and we're constantly in evolution. And right now we've been dipping a little bit into the ketogenic diet. We're finding it fascinating. We're making it our own, but it is a word that is getting tossed around quite a bit now. And I'd love for you to just kind of break it down. What is the ketogenic? What does it include? Let's dig into this. Yeah. And now you're in my wheelhouse. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so most people walking around right now are what we would call sugar burners. So I'd say probably the vast majority, maybe 90 something percent of the world's population is basically burning sugar as their primary fuel source. So they're consuming carbohydrates, sugars, uh, starches, uh, all of these things that would turn to sugar in the body. And so sugar, uh, glucose more specifically is what the body can use as a fuel source but a lot of people don't realize this, but there's another very efficient fuel source that can be used in the body, and that's fat. And so when you lower those levels of sugar, which is why you eat a low-carb diet on a ketogenic diet, and then the other thing that can raise sugar in the body is actually when you consume too much protein. And so that's why we say moderate down the protein to your threshold level. And that's, again, going to vary from person to person depending on your level of insulin resistance. So a low-carb, moderate protein, what's left to eat? It's fat. And so you're eating a high-fat, moderate protein, low-carb diet. When you do that for about maybe two to four weeks, your body does a shift from being a mostly sugar burner to a mostly fat burner. And so that is when you start producing these byproducts of fat burning that's called ketones and the ketones are what sustains you. And so that's your energy source. That's how right now in day six of a, of a fast, I'm actually using ketones pretty darn efficiently to give me energy right now to do this, to do this interview. Um, and so that's pretty much what a ketogenic diet is. It's shifting the fuel source and, and think of it this way. You can have kerosene fuel that burns really white hot, really short amount of time and then it burns up and, and it's gone. Or you can have diesel fuel, which burns at a low level, but strong and steady for a very long time. The diesel fuel is the ketones. The kerosene is sugar. Oh, you bring up so many things I want to get into. So one thing I want to touch upon is the protein, because I think that's somewhere that a lot of people get stuck when it comes to low carb. It's automatically high protein. Yes. And I think after the Atkins diet craze, that was what people thought. I don't think people thought too much about the fat. They were so focused on the protein. So I'd like for you to elaborate on that a little bit of the dangers of eating too much protein and too low fat and for sure low carb. So here's what happened. When the Atkins diet be started becoming popular in the late 90s and early 2000s, people heard low carb when they heard Atkins. So they're like, okay, low carb, that's great. So they say, okay, well, if low carb is good, low carb, low fat must be better. And what they didn't realize is that's not at all what Dr. Atkins taught. Now, Dr. Atkins was brilliant. He was way ahead of his time telling people to keep the carbs low. He says, start at 20 grams and work your way up there based on your insulin resistance. So he was spot on with that. But the mistake I think Dr. Atkins made was he said, eat unlimited amounts of fat and protein. Well, our fat phobic society from the last you know, 30, 40 years of fearing fat heard that and said, oh, fat and protein? Okay, I'll eat chicken breast. Not realizing that that's like all protein, hardly any fat. So people swung in the wrong way when it came to the fat. And that was a mistake because the protein in excess, as I said earlier, turns to sugar in the body. So I'm going to get a little geeky with you now. I don't usually do this, but this, this is an important concept. When you eat too much protein, that excess protein cannot be stored. So you can store you can store sugar basically in the body. You can store glucose um, in the muscles and, and that kind of thing. And then when you have too much sugar in the body, that gets stored as excess body fat. And so, but you can't store protein. And so what happens to that excess protein? It gets sent to the liver 
and the liver converts it over to glucose through this process, and it's a real nerdy word, there will be a test at the end, called gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis is just this fancy schmancy word that says it's a new way to turn glucose in the body, and it's through the protein that you eat, which is why, you know, when people say, well, there are essential proteins, absolutely. There are essential fats, absolutely. But guess what, guys? There is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate because your body knows how to make sugar, carbohydrates, glucose, all from the protein through gluconeogenesis. So that's why too much protein can be bad. And when you're trying to shift your body to being a fat and ketone burner and you're producing sugar vis-a-vis the excess protein because of gluconeogenesis, that's detrimental to getting those effects that you're looking for in a ketogenic state. Okay, great. So let's go back to ketosis and talk about you're in nutritional ketosis right now in the most extreme form because you're you're fasting. So yes. let's just talk about ketosis and the benefits that that brings to someone and and why someone would want to play with it. And that will bring me to my next point, which I can remind you about and bring it back up again. But experimenting <laughs> with exogenous ketones, if someone can't do it yes. the extreme way that you're doing it now, bringing in it from other forms. Sure. And I would I would only agree with you in the description of what I'm doing now is extreme if you just jump right into it. I think if you do it in a methodical way as I have going ketogenic and going intermittent fasting and building your way up, it doesn't seem so bad once you get there. But if you just jump right from the standard American diet, I can imagine 410-pound Jimmy Moore going, you want me to do what? <laughs> so, so I get that. One more time on the question. You caught me down a rabbit yeah, trail Yeah, no, it's okay. The, the benefits of ketosis. Thank you. So... So the main benefit is, do you like being hungry? Most people don't like being hungry. And that's one of the things that foiled me on my low fat diet was I was constantly starving on that. And it was affecting my mood. And I was always angry. My wife, Christine, was like, are, are you okay? You know, you actually change because your body is literally starving. And so one of the things that happens when you go ketogenic, you actually forget to eat. I remember when I first started testing nutritional ketosis in 2012, I was doing a full uh, experiment on my blog, and I remember my wife, Christine, asked me, hey, when's the last time you ate? And I was like, I don't know, it was like maybe 24 hours ago. I had forgotten to eat. Now, when you've heard my story, I used to drink 16 cans of Coca-Cola a day. I would you know, eat whole boxes of Little Debbie snack cakes a day back when I was morbidly obese. And so that's a shock that I would forget to eat. But that's one of the huge benefits of a ketogenic diet is you spontaneously intermittent fast. You have such mood control. I, I think this is one that's not talked about enough because so many people are taking these, uh, these pills, these drugs to try to make their mood better. They're depressed. They're ang you know, anxious. They're taking anxiety medications. All of these things – and I'm just wondering, you know what? If you just ate more fat and cut your carbs and moderated your protein and got ketones going into that brain, which, by the way, your brain loves and thrives on ketones, if you just did that, you might not need those things. And I think about all these like crazy people that you know go around shooting up churches and schools and all this stuff. I, I wonder, are they deprived of fat in their brain? And so – it's something that we need to talk about more and more because I think this is one of the key components of a ketogenic diet that if I got no other benefits from a, from being in ketosis than the brain health benefits, I would do it just for that. So important. And how do exogenous ketones play a role in this? So exogenous ketones are an interesting one because they're, they're kind of new on the market. Uh, there's various brands out there. The Keto OS is probably the most well-known brand. Uh, Dr. Dominique Diagostino down in South Florida was the one who kind of started this. He was using it with Navy SEALs to try to help with them with their endurance. And when they're out on the field and don't have a lot of uh, you know time for eating and they need to be at their sharpest, back to the brain health again, that's where exogenous ketones uh, are very helpful. So for, for the average Joe that's listening or Jane right now, you might be going, well, I've tried ketosis and I can't get into ketosis. And so I've tried moderating my protein. I've tried cutting my carbs. I've tried eating more fat and I'm just not seeing the results I want. That's where exogenous ketones can come in handy. So, so you can take those and it will give you a boost. Now, I've found in my own use of those things, you guys, that 
it doesn't really improve mine that much because I'm already pretty good <laughs> in my ketogenic diet. So they don't really improve upon where I'm at. So if you're already pretty darn good in your ketogenic diet, there's really probably no need for that. But if you're struggling, this can actually give you both a psychological and a physical boost. So let's say you're testing your ketones, and we haven't talked about how you test for ketones, but one of the ways that you test that's the most effective is in the blood. And so let's say you test your blood and you're at the very low end of nutritional ketosis and you're not quite getting all of those benefits. That's where exogenous ketones come in. They will probably double your ketone levels so that you get to that level of therapeutic effects so that you get all those benefits that you're looking for. And what are your thoughts on using MCT oil, something like the Bulletproof Dave Asprey's product there, Brain Octane, to get into ketosis? I'm a big fan of Dave Asprey. I just hate coffee. I told him that. I had him on my podcast one time when he first started talking about uh, the Bulletproof coffee, and I said, dude, I just hate coffee. He said, well, it's the mycotoxins in most coffees. I said, no, 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 I hate coffee. He said, I'll send you some of mine. So he sent some and I made it up and, and everything. I was like, Dave, it's coffee. It's gross. No, <laughs> but no, I think, I think that's pretty good. I, I'm a big fan of the brain octane fuel. Actually, that's what I use as my MCT oil. It's eight times the potency of MCT oil. And so you don't have to use as much of it. And for some people, MCT oil can actually cause uh, digestive issues you don't want to consume too much of it or you will have stomach aches and diarrhea and that's not any fun so finding the right dosage mct oil is a is very powerful and it's a healthy fat so absolutely yeah and you mentioned having it in the coffee there i'm glad you elaborated and said that you do use it in other ways because that stuff is so versatile you can put it on salads yes. you can put it in smoothies Anything. sometimes i just put some in the cap and and shoot it back so it's there great you go. So, Jimmy, let's talk about ketosis and safety. Is this way of eating and, and getting into nutritional ketosis healthy for everyone? You know, I, I'm one of those people that doesn't like to say there is any one diet that fits all. So my gut reaction to your question right off the bat is no, that it's not necessarily good for all. But the safety question, this is just real food people. I mean, that that's one of the things that just perplexes me when people say, well, low-carb ketogenic diets, they're not safe. And so I try to probe deeper. And generally what people are referring to is the saturated fat and the supposed impact on uh, heart disease and cholesterol levels and all that. That's why they're saying that it's unsafe. I actually wrote a whole book about the cholesterol issue called Cholesterol Clarity, What the HDL is Wrong with My Numbers back in 2013, if you want to learn more about that. But yeah, that's usually why there are safety questions. If we get over the fat phobia, and realize that there's so much evidence that saturated fat is so incredibly healthy for you and not these vegetable oil fats. I was listening on the radio earlier today and there was an American Heart Association uh, PSA that ran and it said, good job, you gave up butter today in favor of canola oil. And I'm going, no, canola oil and, and vegetable oils are exactly why we have such disease now. And so these nonsensical attacks against the ketogenic diet that it's unsafe, unhealthy, it's just not true. And in the back of Keto Clarity, we actually listed 186 scientific studies all in support of the positive health benefits of a ketogenic approach. So again, like with the fasting, give it a try, see how you do, give it an honest try uh, you've got to give it at least a two two to four week period to become keto adapted. I would say give it 90 days. And if after 90 days of eating a ketogenic diet where you're testing for ketones and you're seeing ketones and blood sugar, you know, get to where they need to be and you don't feel better, then by golly, stop it at that point. But 90 days, give me the 90 day challenge. Let me know how it goes, because I think virtually anyone could see some benefit and this isn't just for overweight people. Again, it goes back to that weight thing. This isn't about weight loss. It's about health gain. And there are so many things to gain from being in a ketogenic state. So, Jimmy, just to give our listeners an idea for people that this is totally new to them and they need a starting off place, let's talk about your diet and a ballpark figure of the three macronutrients, fat, protein, and carbs, and what you're taking in on a daily basis and how many grams of carbs are you taking in in a day if you have a ballpark idea of that? 
Well, right now, zero. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when I'm eating ketogenically, I know that's what you're asking. I'm, I'm playing with you. Yeah. I like to have fun on podcasts if you haven't noticed. So We appreciate so, um, that. My, yes, that's, that's always fun to listen to. So um, my diet when I'm eating is pretty simple. I mean, I'm not one of these people that has to have such great variety. I hear all these people say, well, eating ketogenic is so boring. It's the same thing over and over. It doesn't have to be, but you know what? Sometimes that's a good way to to stay compliant is sticking with the same thing. So one of my favorite meals, and it not isn't necessarily or necessarily at eight o'clock in the morning, I can eat it at one o'clock in the afternoon, is like three eggs. I have chickens in my backyard. So I'll go back there and I'll grab a few of the chicken eggs and I'll cook those in butter or coconut oil. And then I'll have uh, some cheese melted on top of that. It's like cheddar cheese, Colby Jack cheese, something like that. And then I'll have uh, like an avocado on the side and then maybe some bacon and some sausage. So I'll eat a meal like that at say maybe noon. And I may not be hungry again for most of the rest of the day. If I do get hungry, say around seven, eight o'clock at night, I might have a little steak and some vegetables, fermented foods to get the gut health in there. I like sauerkraut and fermented vegetables. That's always good. Uh, Add a little kombucha maybe to give a little more fermentation. That's important uh, to me. And I think those are the things that pretty much sustain me. Now, we have a whole cookbook that I did with Maria Emmerich called the Ketogenic Cookbook that has a whole variety of recipes in there if people do like the variety. But I'm, I'm pretty much a simpleton when it comes to my diet. Eggs and, and avocado and meat for breakfast uh, for one meal and then steak and vegetables and some fermentation for the other meal. And I'm good. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. So what we're going to do now, Jimmy, as we're wrapping up is go into a rapid fire question round to get to know you a little bit better. And uh, this is probably right up your alley. (laughs) So first thing that comes to mind, what are two things that you like to do every morning to get your day started? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Brush my teeth and, and comb my hair. No, I'm just kidding. What do I do to get started? You know what I do? I play happy music because I need to get in the mood. When you live online, and you guys probably know this, having a popular podcast yourself, there's a lot of a lot of negativity out there, trolls and people that would try to bring you down. So I don't let it happen. And so I'm playing happy music in the morning. I'm getting myself in the right mindset so that I'm ready for the day. And then going along with that, I also meditate slash pray to basically start my day well as well. And and I do that partly to try to bring down stress levels because you know stress can be an unraveling of all the things that we've talked about here today. If you don't get your stress under control, then the rest of your health and, and the rest of the things you're doing in your lifestyle really don't matter because that stress will overtake you. So I'm actively working to do that and meditation and prayer help me do that. Okay. Does your happy music have to do with Ricky Martin at all? It could be living la vida loca, <laughs> but it's usually Pharrell, it's uh, Taylor Swift, Megan Trainer. I could go on and on. I love a lot of different kinds of music. Okay, so next one. What is one thing nobody ever asked you? And I know you've done thousands of interviews, so this is going to be tough. Oh my gosh. But you think about all the time. <laughs> nobody a- has ever asked me, but I think about all the time. Wow. That's a hard one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody's ever asked me before, and I think about all the time. Could be philosophical on life, yeah, anything. I, I'm literally going through everything. Oh, well, number one, I'm going through like two, three thousand interviews I've done in my life. So <laughs> that that's a hard one. Let's circle back to that one. I'll, I'll give you a good answer here in a minute. What's okay, the next one? Perfect. All right. So if you could go out to lunch with anyone, alive or dead, someone that inspires you, who would it be, and where would you go? You know, I would love to talk to Dr. Atkins and I would love to go to a steakhouse with him and just pick his brain of how he came on this subject that we're still talking about more than 10 years after his death, more than almost a half century after he started writing about it and talking about it and showing it with patients long before the science was there, he was doing it. And I would love to pick his brain as to what made it so compelling to him that he decided to start using it as a medical practitioner. It would just be such a fascination to me. And I would literally 
pay anything to have him on my podcast just once. <laughs> okay, good one. And what is an area of your health you had mastered in the past that has now slipped and you're currently working on again? It's weight. When you've been morbidly obese, those fat cells are going to fight you tooth and nail to get back to where they once were. And while I'm nowhere near the 410 pounds I once was, I have more weight on my body right now than I would like to have. And so I'm actively working on that. Like I said earlier, the stress component is a huge part of that. And I'm working to get that down. The fasting is definitely helping with that as well. Uh, but the weight, is it's, it's a challenge. But again, I think we become so focused on weight as kind of a sole predictor of health. I'm trying to, you know, redefine that. So while my weight is up and while I do get a lot of criticism for that, um, I tend to focus on the health changes that are happening that are positive. And I'm sorry, my cat's gone crazy in the background meowing. So. <laughs> That's okay. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Hate is going to hate, so ignore them. Okay. And last one, unless you have an answer to that other one. What is one of your goals for the year ahead? My goal is to keep doing my thing. I have pumped out a book a year for the last four years. I have at least two book projects that are coming next year. Um, and I have, there's just so much happening in 2017. My goal is also to try to handle all of it with the stress that would come along with it and, and maintain my health because it's kind of stupid to be a health, someone talking about health. And your health's falling apart because you're working so hard. So I want to try to find that proper balance between the health and the stress and, and, and all the things that are involved. Okay. And Jimmy, I'll bring it up again if you have something. One thing nobody's ever asked you, but you think about all the time. Nobody ever asks like about my faith and about what, what drives me. Uh, what, what are those components that makes me so motivated now, you know, people often say, you know, I'm glad that you're out there, but, but, but they never ask, what is it that's kind of driving you? Why are you so go, go, go? Cause not everybody does five podcasts a week and writes a book a year. And so I'm just, that's a, that's something nobody's ever asked about. So you want to ask about it now? <laughs> yeah. So what drives you, Jimmy? <laughs> you know, I, I think when my brother Kevin got the heart attacks in 1999 and what I did not tell you earlier is he actually died in 2004 or 2008 um, at the age of 41. And when he died, it shook me. I mean, when he got the heart attacks, that really shook him uh, or shook all of us. But when he died at 41, nobody's supposed to die that early of natural causes, which I even hate to call heart disease natural causes, but it, it really kind of lit something within me that said, I want to save the Kevins of the world out there. And if that means I have to work my butt off to get the message out, then that's what I got to do. And so since 2008, I have had such a love and a passion for helping people that I, I literally, when I encounter someone on social media or they write to me in the email and I get hundreds a day, you know, I feel for those people and want to personally help each and every one of them. And that's what drives me because in all of those people, I see my brother. And so if I can save them, I can't bring Kevin back, but I can save them and, and keep them and their families from going through the heartache and pain that I had to. And that's literally what keeps me going on a daily basis now. Wow, Jimmy, that's some powerful motivation. And, and thank you for sharing that with us. So, Jimmy, where we're going to go next is our final question here. We ask all the guests and we're going to ask you. You've given so much great information on the show to this point. What is one thing you can leave us with, something that can help us reach ultimate health? The best way to reach ultimate health is to take the first step. I think this is the area where people, they're afraid to try anything new. And by the way, you guys, I didn't just suddenly uh, become healthy overnight. I had to take that first step when I was at my unhealthiest state. So no matter where you are in your health right now, you have to take that first step to doing something and get this, you guys, you don't have to be perfect out of the gate, start something, do something, follow really good advice and keep adding to that knowledge. You know, I've been doing this now 
since 2004. So, you know, 12 years and I'm still learning things even now. And I hope I continue to learn things on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis for the rest of my life, because that's how we're going to continue to be healthy and help others get healthy as well. So take that first step. You could be in my shoes very quickly if you take that first step today and you get your health back on track again. That's great. It seems very reasonable and something that uh, most people can approach. So, Jimmy, we know everyone needs to get a copy of your book, The Complete Guide to Fasting. But how else can everyone connect with you? Yeah, so I'm easy to find. Um, I have a website called livinlavidalowcarb.com. And if that's too much to remember, then you could just Google Jimmy Moore. And I'm actually the whole the whole first two pages of, of Google search is me. So that that's kind of cool. So uh, go Google me and listen to my podcast. I have uh, Live and La Vida Low Carb Show, Keto Talk with Jimmy Moore and the Doc and Low Carb Conversations. We give you lots of content when, you are, when you're finished listening to Ultimate Health Podcast. Head on over to hear mine as well. Okay, Jimmy, we're going to make that a lot easier for the listeners and we're going to link everything <laughs> up over in the show notes at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And Jimmy, this has just been such a pleasure chatting with you. You've brought so much great new information to our show and we thank you and we wish you all the best with your future endeavors. Thank you, Jesse and Marnie. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Jimmy. We get into so many different things like the ketogenic diet and we also talk about how to go into ketosis and Jimmy mentions the product Keto OS, which is a product that Jesse and I are using these days. We are loving it in our morning elixir. It helps us feel incredible. Our energy, our vibrancy and our focus and our clarity are all there. So you guys can get your hands on ketones as well. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 126 for orders in Canada and US. You will find the link in our show notes. Order your ketones today and have fun with it. Enjoy your ketones, guys, and we will talk to you soon. Have a great week.